God's peace to you on this 20th Sunday after Pentecost. Our text this morning is taken from St. Mark, the 10th chapter, verses 17 through 31. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And when he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, and children and fields with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. When my oldest child, Claire, was five years old, I was serving uh, as an intern in a small rural Pennsylvania church. The Sunday school superintendent had been raised Baptist and was dead set against infant baptism and pretty much opposed to most Lutheran theology. So this meant my child's Sunday school class was really Baptist indoctrination school. The teacher kept trying to get uh, the kids to say the sinner's prayer and give their lives to Jesus. So one particular Sunday, she asked the kids at prayer time, now what do you need to do to get into heaven? She was hoping they would say, Give your life to Jesus. Not Claire. Claire chimed in with a one-word answer. Die. She wasn't wrong. As a Lutheran theologian of the cross, I thought her answer was kind of dead on. We die to sin. We die to self. We die to the world. Old Adam and old Eve have to be drowned in the waters of baptism. They need to be held under until the bubbles don't come up anymore. This is what our would-be disciple does not understand about following Christ. He asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus could have given a similar answer to Claire's. What must you do? There's nothing you can do. There's nothing anyone can do to inherit anything. An inheritance is given by whomever promises to grant you a gift. And the gift comes upon the death of the one promising the gift. I, it will not be what you do that brings you an inheritance of eternal life. But what I do, I will die. Bringing the gift of eternal life to all who believe my last will and testament grants them eternal life. Jesus, however, has had little success getting his own disciples to understand this word about his death and resurrection. People who follow him every day do not understand that the kingdom of God will be established 
with Christ's forgiveness of sins, his death, his bloodshed. If his own disciples can't hear this word, how can he preach it to this rich man? Jesus first preaches the law to him. Keep in mind that the preaching of the law has two effects. It's good for organizing your life with your neighbors. If my neighbor insists on driving 60 in a school zone, we may have to reorganize our lives a little by taking away their keys or by locking them up until they have better control over their flesh. The law also holds up a mirror and convicts you of your sin. It shows you where you have failed to be righteous, and it also reveals to you you are in real need of a Savior. Jesus takes this young man straight to the law. Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. This sounds like an aside, but really it's Jesus starting with the first commandment. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods. Jesus starts out with this commandment. God alone is good. Why do you call me good? Are you asking this question of a rabbi? Or are you asking me because you think I am the author of eternal life? He then proceeds to answer the question, as God has answered all Jews since Moses. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. The list is interesting. He leaves the three commandments about our relationship to God off the list. Instead, he preaches the commandments about sinning against our neighbor. He lists them all, except the commandments concerning coveting. He lists instead a commandment not written by Moses, you shall not defraud. Coveting is about envy, about wishing you had what someone else has. And it's a sin against God because all that you have comes from God. So coveting is essentially saying that God got it wrong. He chose incorrectly to give your neighbor what you think should have been given to you. Defrauding is something completely different. Defrauding is withholding from another person. You defraud by depriving another, cheating them, taking away from them something that is rightfully theirs. We know the man is very rich and that his wealth comes from owning many lands, those possessions that are spoken of in your text. We do not know how he acquired that land. Did he defraud? Is that why Jesus adds in this commandment? Whether or not it was the sin of defrauding that was a particular favorite of this rich man, Jesus has taken him face to face the mirror with all the laws of Moses that pertain to living with your neighbors. Honor your father and mother, no stealing, no adultery, no murder and the like. And looking into that mirror of sin, the man says, that's kid stuff. I've done that since I was a child. The next line is one of my favorite in all of scripture. Jesus, looking at him, loved him. I call this the, oh, bless your heart response. The man is so captive to his sins that he can't see his own captivity. The old sinner in him is so alive and kicking that he cannot see his fault. And so out of love, Jesus apocalypses him. He uncovers him. He strips him naked before his sins. You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Being rich in Christ's day was a bit of a blessing and a curse. To be given more than others by God showed that you were blessed by God, favored and chosen to be a steward of more than others. But being called a rich man was also synonymous with being called evil. Many of Christ's parables have 
rich men behaving unjustly as characters. The lesson of being rich is this. If you are rich, God has blessed you to bless your neighbors with your wealth. Do this. Use your wealth to bring justice to your neighbor's lives. Man, you have many properties. God has blessed you with these lands. Now go do the second half. Give generously to your neighbors who are poor. This one command crushes the man, and he walks away brokenhearted. Jesus has just used the law to hold up a mirror to him, and it kills him. You call me good, so God is not the center of your life. You defrauded to accumulate your wealth. I commanded you to give to the poor, and you withhold, defrauding both God and your neighbor. You lie about your righteousness before the law. You steal God's gift to the poor. You break the commandment regarding your neighbor and you break the commandments against God because quite clearly your possessions now possess you. You have another God running your life and his name is Mammon. The young man hears his sin he hears the antidote is death. Give up your possessions, your God mammon, and follow me. I will lead you to eternal life, the treasure you seek. And he hears those words and walks away still captive to his sin. Because the price, death, is just too much for him. He walks away rich and sad, broken hearted. And as he leaves, Jesus says, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? His disciples are minds blown. If God has blessed this man with wealth and status and he cannot enter, the he heaven, what chance do poor saps like them have? Peter does some quick calculations and figures that the disciples have left much wealth and family behind. Are the disciples skinny enough camels to make it through the needle? Did they give up enough? Of course, Jesus gives a pretty straightforward answer. It is impossible for you to outgive God. Try and you will find that he continues to bless you. You will receive a hundredfold now in this age. Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields with persecutions. And in the age to come eternal life. What God has in store, your inheritance, is far greater than anything you can give. It comes a hundredfold. It also comes with persecutions. God's gift is not easy street. In faith, in Christ, you will enjoy great blessings and you will suffer great suffering. How can that be? Aren't we all that rich man? Don't we all turn a blind eye when our sin comes into view? Don't we all have sins that own us? And what can we do to inherit eternal life? You can do nothing, says Jesus. See, this rich man could do nothing. He certainly couldn't sell his possessions. For mortals, it is impossible. But not for God. For God, all things are possible. For mortals, it is impossible to die to self, to die to sin, we cannot atone for our own sins, even with our own blood. It is impossible for us to save ourselves. But for God, for Christ, all things are possible. In Jesus, the Alpha became the Omega. The first became the least of all. He did not defraud. He withheld none of his grace. And he became our righteousness. 
as his blood spilled from his wounds, is he his life eternal, his impossible forgiveness became yours. Amen.